to HTTP, all of the all of the supplying these units, um, and is uh, describing the risk characteristics of them. This is an overview of um, the present lecture. We'll discuss in it the respiratory system in terms of its um, anatomical um, organization and the physiology of each of those um, components. We'll discuss the physiology of respiration, including pulmonary ventilation, gas exchange, gas transport, regulation, and breathing patterns, both normal and abnormal. Disorders uh, classified by the level of the segment or the component that is affected, aging of the respiratory system, and types of respiratory uh, treatments. We take a moment and stop this presentation in order to um, review the learning objectives. When we are talking about the um, process of respiration, um, we are calling it um, in a very lay term uh, as breathing. Um, as a scientific definition, respiration can be described as the process by which oxygen is obtained from the environment and delivered to the cells, while carbon dioxide will be um, removed from the level of the tissues from the cell's uh, closed environment and transported to the, um, to the outside in a perfect um, reverse pathway. In order to achieve this type of function, um, we have two systems that are collaborating um, all the time, and that will be the cardiovascular system and the respiratory system. And in order to um, achieve the function that we just described, there are four phases that we encounter during the respiration process. First of them will be the pulmonary ventilation. And in this phase, there is an exchange of air between the outside atmosphere and the alveoli, the air sacs um, that we have inside our lungs. This process, this first stage, um, is accomplished by the process of inhalation and exhalation of breathing. The second step, the second stage or phase, is what is called the external gas exchange. And this occurs at the level of the lungs, while oxygen will diffuse from the air sacs into the bloodstream, while carbon dioxide will diffuse out from the bloodstream into the alveoli sacs, uh, sacs in order to be um, eliminated to the outside. The third phase will be the gas transportation in the bloodstream. The bloodstream that uh, collected the gases from the from the lungs, uh, especially oxygen, will deliver it to the tissues, will release the oxygen to the cells while gaining from the cells, um, taking out from the cells the excess carbon dioxide that will be brought back to the lungs. The fourth and last stage is the internal gas exchange that occurs at the level of the tissues where the oxygen will diffuse freely from the blood to the cells, while carbon dioxide will diffuse from the cells back into the bloodstream to be cleaned out. Um, there is another type of respiration that we describe, and that's described at the level of the cell itself, and it's called um, cellular respiration. In this type of process, the cell will take the oxygen inside and use it inside, uh, usually at the level of the mitochondria, um, in order to break down nutrients and uh, create energy. We'll describe now the structure of the respiratory system. Um, as you can see in this image, the respiratory system is a complex um, system made out of um, a lot of spaces, cavities, and passageways, tubes, that have as main function the conduction of air inside, uh, through the lungs, and uh, back uh, to the outside. And we'll describe each of those elements that we have um, um, 
detail here, the nasal cavities, the pharynx, larynx, trachea, bronchi, lungs, and pleural. We'll start by describing the nasal cavities and um, those are, this is the place where the air will enter the respiratory system. And the entrance of the air uh, is possible due to uh, the openings at the level of the nose. The openings are called nostrils or nares. Um, so immediately inside the nostrils and um, somewhere between the roof of the mouth and the cranium, we have uh, this type of space that you can observe and it's pretty much where the um, nasal cavity points to um, and this is the the actual cavity of the nose those two spaces are separated um, through um, a, a wall a septum is called the nasal septum the septum superior portion is made out by a thin plate from the ethmoid bone while the inferior portion is formed by the uh, another bone that is called the vomer there is an anterior ex extension of the septum um, that is purely uh, cartilage and has no uh, bone component. Both of the uh, nasal cavities are lined uh, by a mucous membrane uh, that uh, its structure is stratified squamous epithelium. Um, and it has to be stratified because those many layers will um, allow for the mucosa of the nose to guard against any type of abrasion uh, or penetration of toxic uh, particles or pathogen. On the lateral walls um, of each of the uh, two nasal cavities, there are present through projections that are called the conchi. Um, and they look like a shell. Uh, they are kind of curved um, around themselves. They have a shell-like type of um, aspect. Uh, and by having this type of um, uh, rounded and concentric type of curving, they uh, increase the, the surface of air um, that comes in contact with the mucous membranes of the nasal cavity. Um, and therefore, because this mucosa contains a lot of blood vessels um, and the surface is quite um, large, it allows to warm the air and deliver inside our um, the rest of the respiratory system um, air that is also um, already um, warm and uh, moist. Those uh, membranes will also secrete a large amount of fluid that up to a quart um, each day. Um, now, breathing through the nose instead of breathing through the mouth will allow the mucosa to warm up and moisten in a very efficient way the inhaled air. In addition to the, a very close actually to the um, uh, nasal cavities, we have um, the paranasal sinuses. Those are very small cavities in the skull bones near the nose and um, they are filled with air and their main function is to uh, be resonating uh, chambers for the voice and also um, by being filled with air allow our head to be uh, not as heavy as it would be if the bones would have been full um, bones filled with uh, bone tissue. Those sinuses are also lined with a mucosa that is similar to the nasal mucosa and it's actually a, a, a continuation of the nasal cavity mucosa uh, because all the sinuses that we um, have at the level of the face, the uh, level of the face and the cranium, um, they communicate freely with the nasal uh, cavity. And because of that, um, there, that will, this type of communication will actually explain to you why the sinuses are so susceptible to um, get infected whenever there is an infection at the level of the throat or nose. The next structure um, that is a continuation of the um, nasal uh, cavities is um, the pharynx. Uh, the pharynx or the throat carry the air into the uh, respiratory tract and also has a double function. It's kind of a crossroad. Uh, will carry foods and liquids into the digestive system. Uh, this uh, organ is a, um, is a muscular organ uh, with, that has a superior portion 
that is located immediately in continuation of the nasal cavity that is called the nasopharynx. The middle part of it, and you please follow me, uh, follow what I'm saying on your image. The middle part that is uh, in part a continuation of the oral cavity is called the oropharynx. And the most inferior portion of this that connects with the next structure of the um, respiratory system is called, called the laryngopharynx. The next structure that continues um, is the uh, continuation of the um, pharynx is called the larynx and uh, or the voice box. And um, it's that portion that will connect the uh, pharynx with the next portion in the, um, at the next segment in the uh, respiratory system that is called the trachea. The larynx has a very rigid type of framework and is made up of nine different um, uh, segments of heal and cartilage in the anterior part and you can follow what I'm saying by um, looking at your image on the right side of your screen the anterior part we have the thyroid cartilage that is that portion that will protrude out in the anterior side of the neck uh, is more prominent in male especially after puberty and is called the Adam's apple um, considerably larger in men and more visible uh, inferior to that big um, kind of a butterfly open structure, there is a different uh, another cartilage that is called called the cricoid cartilage, um, and this one uh, forms a ring um, around just below the thyroid cartilage. Uh, the cricoid cartilage is a landmark uh, whenever we do any type of procedures that will involve the um, the trachea. Now, for a second, we'll move really quick. To discuss the trachea and we'll go back to discuss the larynx and um, the um, uh, vocal folds because I will have an image in the next uh, slide but let's discuss the trachea um, is also called the the windpipe and it's a tube that extends from the inferior edge of the larynx to the level of the mediastinum and uh, it will stop somewhere just superior to the heart where it will split into two main components. Uh, the main function of the trachea is to conduct the air between the larynx and, and the lungs. Uh, it's made out of a, of a framework of separate cartilages um, that reinforce a, a membrane and, and keep it open. Those cartilages, if you look in the picture on the right side, you can see that anterior, they have a complete ring wire in the, in the back. If you are looking from the posterior view, they see that you see that they are incomplete. They have this type of um, this uh, shape of a horseshoe or um, the letter C. Um, this um, open section in the back will be lined up um, and very close to the esophagus um, and can expand into the region uh, during the allow uh, for the swallowing. It's not rigid, so allows the bolus while we swallow food to travel through the esophagus. I will discuss a little bit about the um, vocal cords uh, or the vocal folds. Um, so we have some folds of, of mucous membrane that we are using them to produce sounds, um, especially speech, but any type of, of sounds. And those are located uh, in the center part, in the center superior part of the larynx. Um, so we call them vocal folds or vocal cords. Uh, they will vibrate as the air goes in and out, and as a result of that, sounds are produced. You can actually feel them if you if you you can feel the vibration while if you touch your your throat in the anterior part while you're talking, you can feel um, the vibration. Um, the variation in the length and the tension of the vocal cords and the distance between them will differentiate between the different pitches of sound. The amount of air that is pushed out through them will give you the volume of the sound. So there is a difference in the size of the larynx and um, that of the vocal cords. Um, and that will um, give you the differences between the
the um, adult male and female voices. We have different types of voices with uh, female voices having um, having a higher pitch because, um, or let's put it like that, men have lower pitches because their larynx is a little bit larger and their vocal folds are thicker and longer. So they will, their vibrations will be slower. There are some muscles at the level of the pharynx, um, the muscles of the tongue, the lips, and the muscles of the face will all participate in order to articulate sounds or modify sounds. And keep in mind that the um, pharynx, all those muscles that I named, pharynx, tongue, lips, and face, those are all voluntary muscles. So they are under our um, control. Um, they, um, there is another structure that it's located um, in, the, in the space between the vocal cords and that structure is called uh, the glottis. This uh, area is partially open during normal breathing, but will, be, will open very, very well when we uh, forcefully breathe out. We have some other folds that they are located just superior to the um, to the vocal cords uh, in the laryngeal mucous membrane, and those are known as those are called uh, vestibular folds. Um, they are also called the false vocal cords because they do not contribute to speech uh, production. However, the muscles of the, the larynx can bring those um, folds together to close off the glottis completely, and by doing that. They help to keep up materials out of the respiratory tract while we are swallowing. So they are kind of closing because it's a crossroad at that level. They will close um, with the uh, with a structure that is called the epiglottis. They will close the respiratory um, tract and will allow to be open only the digestive system. So the glottis will be covered by a little leaf-shaped cartilage um, that is called the epiglottis. What is the most superior portion of the pharynx? A. Laryngeal pharynx, B. Septum, C. Nasal pharynx, or D. Oral pharynx. The most superior portion of the pharynx is the nasal pharynx. We'll discuss now the structures of the the structure of the uh, bronchi and the lungs. So once the trachea is reaching the mediastinum, just a period to the heart, it will branch out into, will completely divide into two main stems. Uh, and the, a, the trachea will make what is called the, uh, the primary bronchi. Uh, and those structures will enter the lungs. The um, trachea will um, divide into the left and right uh, main uh, bronchus, main stem bronchus. Uh, those um, structures will have full cartilage, full cartilage rings that will stabilize their structure as opposed to uh, previously in the trachea where we had only the C, the incomplete types of cartilages. Uh, so at the level of the uh, main stem bronchus, the cartilages will be uh, complete and will stay open by being so strong, will keep the air passage open at all times. The right bronchus is larger in diameter than the left one and has a, a downward uh, in a more vertical type of direction, while the uh, left one is a little bit more horizontal. Um, because ha it has this kind of vertical uh, type of um, deploying of the right lung um, main stem, the, whenever a foreign body will be inhaled, it is most likely to enter and lodge into the right uh, lung at the level of the uh, main stem, right main stem. Um, both right and uh, left uh, bronchi will enter the lungs in, um, in a depression uh, at the level of the lung that is called the hilum, um, along with blood vessels and nerves. Um, and that region is also known as the root of the lung. The uh, trachea and bronchi and uh, all the rest of the conductive pass uh, passageways that we have in our respiratory system are uh, 
covered in the mucosa um, and the type of tissue that is um, covering um, those structures will be a ciliated columnar epithelium. Um, and they have what is called uh, a cilia because that allows, um, has, a, has a function. And the function is to clean out the dust and the particles and whatever can come through the air inside our lung. Um, now, the um, nuclei of those um, columnar cells are not situated at the same level. And as a result of that, if you remember, we discussed the pseudostratified um, tissue. Because they have different levels of um, nuclei um, situ um, location, it may look like is a stratified epithelium. However, it's just one layer, and it's called pseudo stratified or falsely stratified. In addition, in this epithelial membrane, we have a lot of goblet cells that they will produce the uh, mucus that allows to trap dust and pathogens that will be um, removed by the movements of the uh, cilia. We have two, uh, two lungs, a right and left one, that will contain um, will be made out both of uh, air passageways that become smaller and smaller by branching out, and also by um, their own um, lung tissue um, that is made out of thin walled sacs that are called um, alveoli. Um, at the level of the lungs, uh, the external gas exchange will take place. Um, the lungs are situated. Um, one on each side of uh, our uh, thoracic cavity, one on the right and one on the left. Um, between them, we'll have a space that is called mediastinum, uh, where we find the heart, the great blood vessels, and there will be some other organs. If you remember, the thymus is also located over there. Now, the, um, ling the left lung will have an indentation on its medial side in order to accommodate the heart, will be a little bit uh, skewed. The lungs will be divided and um, the right lung will be uh, divided by a horizontal and an oblique fissure and will have, um, as a result of that, three lobes, a superior, a medial, and an inferior lobe, while the left lung, being smaller because it needs to accommodate the heart, part of the heart on the left side is divided by a single oblique fissure uh, into two lobes, the superior and inferior. The lobes will be divided uh, subsequently into segments and lobules, um, and this subdivision will correspond to subdivisions of the bronchi, because the bronchi will branch out throughout the lungs. So immediately uh, after the entrance, the right bronchus or the left, uh, the right will divide into three lobar uh, bronchi, while the left one um, will have only two. Um, and they will subdivide again and again, becoming smaller and smaller, pretty much like the um, uh, cardiovascular system will branch out into smaller and smaller uh, diameter vessels. Uh, when we look at this, and because they are branching out, uh, we are calling this a bronchial uh, tree. At a certain level, the uh, bronchi will, divide, will um, become will reach their smallest um, diameter, and this is called a bronchiole. Um, at the level, from, from a histologic point of view, um, they are changing in terms of their um, structure. The amount of cartilage will be smaller um, until it will completely disappear at the level of the bronchiole. Uh, however, what will stay is the smooth muscle, and that's what you see in your picture. You see that we have a terminal bronchiole that has just the smooth muscles and doesn't have any type of cartilage rings around it. Um, the uh, smooth muscle at this point is under the control of the autonomic nervous system. The alveoli are um, those um, and sacs that will connect to the terminal bronchioles and they represent the smallest um, subdivision of the, um, the bronchial tree. They come out as clusters. They are tiny air sacs. And at the level of those air sacs, um, the external gas exchange will take place. 
they are uh, covered from the outside, as you can see in the picture, in by capillaries. Now, there are about um, 3, 000, uh, 300 million um, alveoli in the in the human lungs, uh, with the resulting surface of contact with for gas exchanges uh, up to about 60 square meters. Um, it, it's a very uh, wide surface that allows for a quick and very efficient gas exchange. Um, however, um, we are not always using the entire capacity of our lungs. Uh, we have what is called the functional, functional reserve. Um, we usually use and um, utilize about one third of the lung tissue that is necessary. The rest of it will be considered the functional reserve and will be used in just certain conditions whenever the um, needs of oxygen uh, will increase. Now, because the lung has this type of sponge type structure uh, and is full of air, uh, they are very light in weight. Um, in, whenever we have a, a piece of tissue um, uh, from the lungs that is removed, if we are placing it in a, in a container that has water, it will, um, it will float because of the uh, large amount of air that is um, um, captured and um, exists inside the alveola. So through the pulmonary circuit, the blood will uh, come to the level of the lungs um, and the transfer um, of the uh, oxygen uh, will happen while the removal uh, of the carbon dioxide towards the outside environment uh, will take place as well. We'll discuss now the lung cavities and the pleuris. So, as I said before, the lungs are um, uh, occupying a, a good deal of the uh, thoracic cavity. Um, and the thoracic cavity is uh, separated from the abdominal cavity through um, a muscle, uh, a very well defined and developed muscle that is called the diaphragm. There is um, a cover that uh, encloses the lungs, each of them separate. And this is a continuous double sac and it's called the pleura. Um, it, it is a serous membrane and has an epithelial layer um, that is covering the areolar uh, tissue. The two layers of the pleura are named according to their location. Um, probably remember from my previous lecture when I said that all those serous membranes that are covering um, a, a wall a part of our body will be called parietal, while the um, layer that covers the organ itself will be called the visceral one. So in the case of the uh, lung, we have the parietal pleura that covers the chest wall and the diaphragm, while the visceral pleura will cover um, the lung surfaces in between those two spaces, we have a tiny space um, that, again, like in other serous uh, membranes, um, will have a tiny, a thin film of fluid that is produced by the serous uh, membrane. And um, this, uh, this space is called the pleural uh, space. The main role of the space in the, in the fluid is to allow for um, expansion and contraction um, of the chest and uh, the lungs during their um, functioning to be smooth um, and uh, prevents uh, friction. You can see here the, uh, the structure and you can see how the uh, pleura, the uh, parietal one is um, aligned, is, is draw for you in a dark blue and you can see how it covers the whole uh, lung goes around while the uh, parietal one is the light blue and you can see how it adheres to um, the lobes and it goes inside the fissures in between the lobes. Where is pleural space located? A, between neighboring alveoli, B, between the layers of the membrane covering the lung, or C, between the ribs, or D, in the nasal cavity. 
floor of space is located between the layers of the membrane covering the lungs and pleura. The respiration process, as we described it at the beginning of this lecture, will involve a few phases, and those are the ventilation of the lungs, where the exchange of gases at the level of the lungs and later at the level of the body tissues, as well as the um, circulation or the transport of the gases um, in the blood from the lungs to the tissues and uh, from the tissues back to the lungs. Um, we'll discuss now the pulmonary ventilation um, and its, uh, its phases. Uh, so the ventilation represents the movement of the air in and out the lungs. And we accomplish that by the act of breathing. Um, the act of breathing or the ventilation involves uh, two phases. One will be the inhalation, drawing the air inside the lungs. And the second one will be the exhalation or the expiration, that is the elimination of the air from the lungs in the outside atmosphere. In um, order for that to happen, the air will follow a pressure gradient from one area with high pressure to the areas with a lower pressure. In other words, the inhalation will happen, the air will get inside the lungs the moment that the pressure inside the lungs, or um, in a better way to say that the pressure inside our thoracic cavity will drop under or below the uh, atmospheric pressure. Opposite to that, the expiration is um, happening when the lung pressure or the pressure inside the thoracic cavity will rise above the atmospheric pressure. So it may be seen as a passive process. However, it's active because it involves the activity of some muscle. So in inhalation, the active phase of quiet breathing there are some respiratory muscles at the level of the thorax, and in addition to that, also the diaphragm that will contract and will increase, will enlarge um, the volume of the thoracic cavity. As a result of that, um, the while moving like that, the uh, diaphragm is, and you can see it in, in the picture, it's a dome-like type of muscle that it's attached to the body wall um, around pretty much as at the base of the uh, at the rib cage. By contracting, the diaphragm will flatten itself, and and the action of the um, the diaphragm is similar to a piston. Um, by doing that, is increasing the whole thoracic cavity, and the pressure uh, inside will. Um, increase, I'm sorry, the pressure inside the thoracic cavity will decrease, allowing the atmospheric uh, air to get in. Now, while the thoracic cavity will increase in size, as I said, the ga gas pressure within the cavity will decrease. And this follows uh, this type of very basic law of physics um, that and you can see it in, the, uh, in this image um, by the relationship between the volume pressure and flow for any type of fluid. And keep in mind that air is a type of fluid. So um, this law of physics is um, stating that when the volume of a given amount of gas increases, the pressure of the gas decreases because the particle will spread themselves in a higher volume. As opposed to that, when the volume will decrease, the pressure will increase because I'm pushing the particles together and they will start um, uh, cramming in a, in, a smaller, in a smaller place. Now we can see in this picture that um, the pressure gradient, um, you can see the, the numbers of the pressure gradients that in, allow us to um, ventilate our lungs to, to, uh, for the breathing process to take place. So during inhalation, the pressure in the chest again will drop. It's not a critical or uh, an, an extreme drop in the pressure. However, it allows the air to get in. Because if you look 
between the rest and the inspiration, you see that the difference is not critical. It's only, only two millimeters mercury. Um, conversely, uh, when we are expiring and the um, diaphragm releases itself and by releasing um, the contraction is pushing on the um, um, on the lungs and the respiratory the thoracic respiratory muscles also are relaxing during expiration they are coming back as a recoil and they will put pressure on the lungs the pressure inside the lungs will increase over the pressure on the atmosphere and um, not by much again uh, but enough to expose uh, the air out. So now that thinking about the mechanism and the, the phases that I described before, um, you can understand that there are a few uh, determinants, a few elements or a few characteristics that will determine um, the airflow and how quick or how uh, slow or how efficient the airflow will pass um, through our uh, passageways in our respiratory system. Um, and one of those determinants is called um, the compliance. Now, when a lung is healthy, the tissue is healthy, um, they have, the tissue has a lot of compliance, has a lot of ability to expand, has a lot of elastic fiber. Whenever there is a scar tissue inside the lungs, that will become less compliant and of course will interfere with the inhalation. Um, also, whenever the lungs are losing elasticity, and you see it as a, as a common denominator in most of our um, lectures when we are discussing aging elements, um, that we are losing elasticity in our tissues. So that will happen at the level of the lungs as well, um, and the compliance will decrease with aging. There is also, um, that thin film of water that um, will line out the alveoli. So the alveoli, because they are those kind of tiny sacs, um, if you just have them dry, they will have a tendency that the moment that will be unfilled with, with air to kind of collapse on themselves and by touching each other to stick and not open again to the next uh, breath uh, when need to fill them when we need to fill them with air. Therefore, on the inside there is a thin film of fluid that will line the alveoli, and it's kind of moisturing and um, it gives them the ability to stay open. And even when they are collapsing, because they are not filled with uh, air in the exhalation process, they will not completely collapse and and uh, touch each other. Um, and this tiny, um, this thin uh, layer of uh, fluid is reducing what is called the surface tension. Um, in addition to that, we have what is called the resistance. Uh, the resistance is um, the force that prevents the entrance of the air inside the airways and the free movement of the air through the airway. And it's easy to um, imagine by just by imagining that you need to blow through tubes of different uh, diameters. It's easier to blow through a tube that has a large diameter as opposed to um, a diameter that is very small. So the resistance to the blood, to the um, airway flow, I'm sorry, the resistance to the um, airflow will decrease along with the branching out of the uh, respiratory system of the bronchi uh, becoming increased in the small um, um, uh, uh, bronchial. You figure it out probably by now that the exhalation is the passive process um, in the breathing um, mechanism. Uh, and it's the result of the relaxation of the muscles involved in inspiration. The diaphragm will relax as well as the thoracic muscles will relax. And by uh, relaxing, they will push back on the elastic lung tissues and the inside 
uh, will create a decreased lung volume, and as a result of that, will be an increased pressure inside the thorax that will move the air um, through the um, airway passages outside. We have also what is called a forced exhalation, uh, and that's an increased uh, muscle contractions from the internal intercostal muscles that will pull the bottom of the ribcage inside and downwards, kind of squeezing even more the um, uh, thoracic cavity. As a result of that, um, more air can be eliminated. However, even with what we call the maximum exhalation capacity, we are not able to expel all the air from the lungs because there is Again, that residual volume that will always uh, be left inside and fills uh, part of the airways and part of the alveolus. A way to examine and um, evaluate the ventilation, the efficiency, effectiveness of ventilation in a patient is by using an instrument that is called a spirometer. The spirometer has a mouthpiece that is connected to the patient's mouth, uh, and the patient will do will perform certain um, inspiration or expiration types of um, um, activity based on what we are asking them to do. While the machine is registering the volumes that are inhaled and exhaled by the patient. If you follow on the graph, you can see that we have what is called a functional residual capacity. Um, and this functional, functional residual capacity is about um, 1,800 cc's, um, if you look at it. And um, that's um, always present at the level of our lungs. And when we take um, a breath in and out in, at rest, not doing any kind of crazy activity, we will register on spirometry what is called the tidal volume. And the tidal volume is about 500 uh, cc's. When we ask the patient at the end of an expiration, a normal one, to exhale, to eliminate as much as possible more air out of their lungs, then we are measuring what is called the um, expiratory reserve volume. And the expiratory reserve volume adds up uh, for another 700 uh, cc's. So if we do the math, we see that the residual volume is that volume of air that will always be in our uh, lungs. And it, we can find out the value by deducting the expiratory reserve volume from the functional residual capacity. And we see that the residual volume um, equals about uh, 1 liter and 100 uh, cc's. When we ask the patient to take um, a breath that is as deep as they can. Um, in a normal individual, we'll measure the inspiratory reserve volume, and the inspiratory reserve volume, it's about 1,900 cc's. We see that it's very, very um, high. If we put together the inspiratory reserve volume plus the tidal volume plus the expiratory reserve volume, we end up measuring what is called the vital capacity. And it's about a little bit over uh, three liters, is uh, 3,100 cc's. When we add up to that, also the residual volume will end up having a measurement that is the total lung capacity, that is 4,200 cc's in a normal individual. And you can understand how those elements, depending on the condition that the patient has, can change and can help us in, in diagnosing uh, different conditions. We just have now the, the gas exchange. And we have what is called the external gas exchange, that the movement of the gases between the alveoli and the capillary blood is the exchange of gas at the level of the lungs. You understand by now probably that uh, the gas exchange is governed by the concept of the flow. Um, and the gases are exchanged by diffusion. What separates the, um, the two um, spaces, the bloodstream and the uh, lungs uh, alveolized, um, there are membranes. And um, 
is the alveolar wall and the capillary wall. They are both very thin and they are both um, uh, one layer of cells in order to minimize the resistance uh, and promote diffusion. In addition to that, do you remember that respiratory membrane, that area uh, in the alveoli is also uh, moist. And this is necessary because both oxygen and carbon dioxide need to become a solution, need to be dissolved in some type of fluid in order to be able to get across those uh, membranes. Once the gas is dissolved in a fluid, we can measure its concentration by defining its uh, partial pressure. And you will see that um, uh, in most of the um, books that you will read, uh, written as a capital P uh, followed by an um, underscript um, O2 or CO2. So the gases will diffuse from the area of low pressure to the area to with with the, from the area with the high pressure, I'm sorry, towards the area with a lower pressure. So at the level of the alveoli, we'll have in the bloodstream, we'll have low oxygen because they are coming from the cells where the oxygen was used. Therefore, the oxygen will move from the alveoli inside the bloodstream. As opposed to that, in the bloodstream, I have high levels of CO2 that is the result of metabolism in the tissues that will be exchanged back um, to the alveoli to be eliminated uh, to the outside. Now, we have a similar process that happens in during what is called internal gas exchange, and that takes place between the blood and the tissues. Um, in order to be easy for you to remember the internal and external exchange, think about the external exchange, um, the one that happens in the lungs to go to the outside, while the internal one happens inside our body. It's in between the bloodstream and every single tissue in our body, let's say a muscle tissue. Um, over there, the process is just the opposite. The arterial blood is carrying high levels of oxygen that are needed by the cell, so the oxygen will diffuse to the cell, while the CO2 at the level of the cell that was already processed and is the result of the metabolism, the cellular metabolism will enter the capillaries and will be removed from that area. We were saying throughout this lecture that the oxygen is transported and the carbon dioxide is transported also, but how did that, this happen actually? Um, and let's define for each of them. How does um, our bloodstream transport um, oxygen to, to the tissue. So only a very little amount of the oxygen will be dissolved in the uh, fluid part of the blood. Only 1.5% will be um, uh, dissolved. The rest of it, 98.5, is transported by, uh, by the um, red blood cells. And the red blood cells are transporting the oxygen uh, through the support of the hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, if you remember, is that uh, big um, protein molecule um, that is based on iron that is able to bind each uh, hem uh, portion will bind one molecule of oxygen. Therefore, there will be four molecules of oxygen that each um, red blood cell is able to uh, transport. So if, when we are measuring the level of oxygen in arterial blood in a normal individual, we'll find out that the saturation with oxygen is about 97%. Um, that means that there will be some hemoglobin molecules that will bind instead of having four uh, sites uh, connected, we'll have only three. Part of this oxygen will be delivered to the tissues, and when we are measuring the level of oxygen um, in the uh, in a vein, we'll find out that the saturation is about 70%. So we have about the difference of 27% that was the delivered oxygen to the cell. Now that highly oxygenated uh, blood, we'll call it again the red blood, we'll call it oxygenated, while the 
uh, blood in the veins, we call it deoxygenated. However, the level is not completely zero. So you can understand now why circulation during the CPR is so important and not that much the breathing because I still have high levels of oxygen that I can deliver to the tissues. However, if I don't have a pump, if the blood is not flowing, there is no delivery. That's why the circulation in the CPR takes precedence to the respiration up to a point definitely, but the first thing that we start with is always the circulation. Uh, in order to um, get and be able to be extracted uh, by a cell from the bloodstream, the oxygen must separate from the uh, hemoglobin. So normally this bond between the oxygen and hemoglobin is very, um, is very um, uh, unstable. It's easy to be broken um, because the cells need to extract quickly. There is a combination um, that um, will block completely and forever, uh, it's irreversible, um, the uh, hemoglobin molecules, and that will be the carbon monoxide. Um, the carbon monoxide, once uh, bound to hemoglobin, um, and it binds itself to the same site where the oxygen is doing, is blocking the hemoglobin and not allowing the hemoglobin to carry oxygen. And that's how the death happens in um, uh, carbon monoxide intoxications while the blood becomes incapable of delivering oxygen to the tissues. From the other point of view, carbon dioxide is produced uh, continuously at the level of the tissues in the metabolism of the, uh, of the cells. Um, about 10% of it will be dissolved in the plasma. Um, about 50% will be combined with uh, the proteins in hemoglobin and some in the plasma proteins. So compared to the oxygen, you see that the hemoglobin is carrying only a little bit of the carbon dioxide. And the big, big chunk of this carbon dioxide will be transported as an ion known as the uh, bicarbonate ion, which forms while the carbon dioxide will um, go through a reversible, reversible, you can see that the arrow goes both ways, a reversible reaction with water. So carbon dioxide once in water will create what is called the carbonic acid that um, under the action of an enzyme that is called the carbonic anhydride. Um, and this carbonic acid also will decompose itself into a hydrogen ion and a bicarbonate ion. So if you remember when we discussed in chapter two, this um, acid-base balance, um, you heard a lot about the hydrogen ions and like the carbonate ions. Well, the carbon dioxide now, you can see how it becomes important in regulating the blood pH. Uh, because the bicarbonate can uh, become a buffer and um, try and balance uh, whenever there is an excess of hydrogen ions um, and the opposite. Whenever um, there is an excess of base, the hydrogen ion will compensate and buffer. Which of the following describes what occurs in the lung? Both oxygen and carbon dioxide diffuse from the blood into the alveoli. B. Oxygen diffuses into the blood and carbon dioxide diffuses into the alveoli. C. Carbon dioxide diffuses into the blood and oxygen diffuses into the alveoli. Or D. Both oxygen and carbon dioxide diffuse from the alveoli into the blood. The um, events that happen that occur in the lung are oxygen diffuses into the blood and carbon dioxide diffuses into the alveoli. We discuss now the uh, control or the regulation of the ventilation and you will see that um, that can happen um, through two mechanisms. Uh, it can be done um, as a chemical control or it can be done as a result of the CNS, uh, central nervous system uh, control or the respiratory uh, 
control center um, that is present in the brain. At the level of the brain, we have a respiratory control center that is a complex uh, network of neurons. They are located in the medulla and also in the in the fonts. So you can see that they are located in what is called the primitive part of the brain, not at the level of the cortex. And this is what we have similar with other um, organisms. So the main part um, is located in the medulla and will generate um, impulses that will provide the basic pattern um, of respiration. Uh, at rest, usually, this center will fire about 12 times per minute. As a result of that, we take a breath about every five seconds. You will see in a second how actually this pattern can change and this center will respond to impulses from other areas of the brain. So the fibers from the uh, medulla, from the um, um, center uh, that coordinates, that is the respiratory control center, will send fibers that extend themselves inside the spinal cord. From the cervical part of the cord, those fibers uh, will continue through the phrenic nerve, which is uh, a branch of the uh, vagus nerve. And the phrenic nerve will provide the innervation to the diaphragm, and also part of it will go to the intercostal muscles. This is a motor nerve because it will provide commands to an effector, to muscle. In, from one point of view, um, the diaphragm and the respiratory muscles are involuntary because they work uh, without us thinking that we are breathing. From another point of view, um, the, both the diaphragm and the intercostal nerves can become voluntary because we can command our breathing. We can breathe more rapidly or uh, we can hold our breath or we can breathe deeper, uh, depending on how we um, decide to do that. And this is because there is a certain voluntary control, and you can see it in orange uh, in, a, in your diaphragm. So from, from the cortex, there are fibers that are commanding and they are changing the rhythm of the uh, main respiratory center. There are some other elements that are controlling our respirations and the respiration, and this uh, those elements um, are part of the chemical control of the ventilation. There are some um, chemoreceptors. And if you remember, the chemoreceptors are those cells that are responding to changing in concentration of different substances in our blood. Those central chemoreceptors are located in medulla oblongata and there are some also some peripheral chemoreceptors at the level of the carotid artery and in the aorta. What they do perceive, they perceive and they respond with impulses to changes um, in the level of blood gases that comes in touch with them. In response to that, to changes in the um, concentration of gases in the peripheral blood, the hypothalamus may increase ventilation whenever there is an increased CO2 level as a result of what is called hypercapnia. And as a result of that, there will be an increase in rate of breathing along with the depth of breathing. So we breathe faster and deeper. And by doing that, we eliminate more CO2. Um, another factor that will um, regulate our um, breathing, um, there are some uh, mechanical receptors. Uh, we have what is called a stretch receptor uh, in the lung airways that will stop inhalation. No matter how much our brain will command to take more and more air in, that will not going to be possible because those stretch receptors will prevent an overexpansion of the lung. We also have um, proprioceptors. receptors um, that are located in muscles and joints, um, and those will enable the respiratory center to match ventilation to some exercise intensity, because proprioceptors are giving us information regarding position of different parts of our body um, in space. Okay. 
let's summarize now what is um, the feedback, which is, again, in terms of homeostasis, is a negative feedback that will regulate the ventilation. Let's start by an increased arterial CO2, that on the left of your image in green. That will be perceived by the chemoreceptors at the level of medulla oblongata. However, it can be seen, it can be um, uh, perceived also uh, by the receptor in aorta or the carotid artery that will send impulses and will alert the same center in medulla. So those centers will send signals to the respiratory center. The respiratory center through the phrenic nerve will send electric signals that will increase the activity of the diaphragm and intercostal muscles by increasing the depth and the rate of the respiration. As a result of an increased depth and rate of respiration, more CO2, an additional quantity of CO2 will be eliminated. And as a result of that, the arterial CO2 will decrease. We'll summarize again here the negative feedback um, that uh, keeps this arterial level of CO2 constant. And if you see, do you notice that I'm not relating to oxygen at all? So you can understand that. Please remember this physiological mechanism because it's, it's, it's essential later uh, through our program uh, for you to understand uh, mechanisms of uh, pathophysiological mechanism of diseases and why we treat certain diseases in certain ways is because what regulates and maintains our respiration is not the levels of oxygen. What will change, what's the game changer and uh, promotes respiration or stops respiration is the level of CO2. So let's start at the, um, at the level of the cerebrospinal fluid, let's say. Uh, let's start with number one. And you see over there that um, CO2 will diffuse into CSF and into the uh, medullary uh, cells. Uh, and if you can see, if we, we have in the image, you have the uh, membrane and you have the, um, with the, the blood brain barrier, which is a membrane um, made out of cells that will separate the uh, brain tissue from the bloodstream. Whenever there is an increased CO2 level in the bloodstream, the CO2 will diffuse inside the CSF and the medullary cells. And at the level of the medullary cell will combine with water and will produce the bicarbonate and the, um, the ion, the proton. The proton, which is acidic, will stimulate the neuron. That's the signal. That's the chemo uh, signal. That's the chemical signal that will stimulate the neurons that will produce um, an, an impulse at the level of the pons and the medulla. And as a result of that, will activate the medulla. And as a result of that, the medulla will activate and will increase the activity of the muscles, both the diaphragm and the intercostal um, muscles. And as a result of increased activity of those, the high level of CO2 in the blood will be corrected by increasing the depth and rate of respiration. We'll discuss now different types of uh, breathing patterns. So the normal breathing rate, uh, we already stated that, will, be, will vary between 12 and 20 breaths per minute for adults, will be increased in children, uh, will be between 20 and 40 minutes uh, for children, depending on their age and size, the smaller the child or younger the child, the higher will be the breathing rate. While in infants, um, the rate may be 40 and sometimes even higher than that, uh, especially if they are uh, premature. Let's look at some types of um, altered or changed or modified types of uh, patterns of breathing. Well, half of this called uh, first of all, let's define the, uh, what is the suffix, uh, the word ending, uh, pnea. Uh, pnea means breathing. Everything that relates to the breathing will have that um, word ending, that suffix. So we have hyperpnea that represents an increase in the depth and the rate of breathing in order to meet the body metabolic needs, um, as in any type of stress. 
who will be hypopnea in stress is fever or injury or pain or exhaust. We have hypopnea as opposed to hyper. Hypo is a decrease in rate and depth of breathing. We have tachypnea, which is an excessive rate only. Um, it can be physiological as it happens in exercise, or it can be a tachypnea that is uh, pathological associated to certain conditions. We have apnea, which is a temporary cessation of breathing. Especially when we are in a deep sleep mode, um, apnea can um, appear for very short periods of time, uh, and it can be physiological, it can be normal. Um, we do have what is called severe sleep apnea um, that happens in those individuals that have uh, obstructive, uh, chronic obstructive um, uh, pathology of their respiratory passageway. Another term will be dyspnea, which is a subjecting feeling of difficulty or labored breathing. Um, the patient may complain that it's hard to breathe and sometimes dyspnea can be observed as a sign. It's not always a symptom. Sometimes you can see that the patients are doing some kind of elaborate types of breathing and you see their muscles moving um, in an unnatural way that suggests that um, they have an inability to breathe at that moment. Orthopnea refers to a difficulty in breathing that is relieved when the patient is sitting uh, or um, is uh, propped by pillows in, in bed or when it's leaning over a chair. Q-small respiration is a deep and rapid respiration that is typical for acidotic states of, uh, or conditions. Uh, it's very common, uh, commonly seen whenever we have a crisis of uncontrolled diabetes. Um, and another type of a pathological breathing pattern um, is the uh, Shane Stocks uh, respiration, which is a rhythmic variation in depth that will um, alternate with periods of apnea. Um, it's um, a profound malfunctioning of the breathing center. It's usually in critically ill patients or in dying patients will see this type of respiration. It will start with small breathing that will increase up to a very deep type of breath and after that they will stop breathing. And after a short period of non-breathing, they will start again in the same cycle. We'll discuss now abnormal types of ventilation. Uh, we'll define as hyperventilation of rate and depth of breathing that breathing that is increased and abnormal. When can we see that? We can see it in a um, situation when the patient has an anxiety attack, in pain, in uh, stress. As a result of hyperventilation, because we are removing, it's a high, again, high rate and high depth. As a result of that, we are eliminating too much oxygen. And as a result of that, we get into a state, the patient will get into a state that is called hypocapnia. And as a result of the hypo hypocapnia, um, they will become, uh, their blood will become alkalotic, will have an alkalosis state. Um, what happens with that is that we need to encourage the patient to take slow breath and deep breath instead of um, um, very quick ones and reassure them that everything is good and calm them down um, because usually at a certain point they will faint if they are keep going um, with this type of breathing. The other end of the condition will be um, of abnormal ventilation will be hypoventilation. And in a hypoventilation, there is not enough air in order, not enough air enter and ventilate the alveoli in order to maintain um, a normal oxygen level, um, at the normal oxygen level at the tissue level. 
we uh, result in the blood, we call it uh, hypoxemia, low levels of oxygen in the blood, hypoxia, low levels of oxygen at the level of the tissues. And as a result of that, um, we find um, as when we are examining the blood, we'll see that the blood is, uh, the state of the patient will be um, acidosis, uh, high acidity in the body, um, along with cyanosis, that is that uh, bluish color of the skin and the mucous membranes as a result of low levels of uh, oxygen in connected to um, or uh, uh, bound to hemoglobin. Where are the most important changes for elevated levels of carbon dioxide located? A, alveolite, B, medulla oblongata, C, cerebral cortex, or D, aorta. The most important changes for elevated levels of carbon dioxide are located at the level of medulla oblongata. We'll look into uh, major uh, respiratory disorders and we'll do it as uh, always in a structured way going by uh, how they affect several uh, parts of um, the respiratory system. Uh, and we'll start with the level of the uh, nasal cavity. At the level of the nasal cavity, uh, one of the most common conditions will be um, an inflammation that is called sinusitis. It can be acute or chronic. Uh, chronic is when it's uh, long-standing, um, and it's a result of an inoculation, an, infect, an infection that results through traveling uh, of the bacteria or viruses from the mouth, nose, or throat through the continuous mem mucous membranes from the, those cavities inside the sinuses. Uh, in addition to that, at the level of the uh, sinuses, we can have uh, uh, tiny uh, polyps uh, or <clears throat> tumors that are benign tumors. Another condition will be a deviated septum, and you can see it in the, in the picture here, um, the septum being the partition between the two uh, cavities. Um, a deviated septum will make uh, one nasal space smaller than the other. Um, we may see it more common in patients that have hay fever or have um, um, developing colds more often uh, because of the space that is closer and will retain a pathogen. Uh, another condition at the level of the nasal cavity that is um, encounter will be the epistaxis. Um, epistaxis comes from a Greek word that means to drip. That's an injury to the mucous membranes of the nasal cavity. The uh, mucosa of the nose is very um, high, has a high vascular supply. Remember that it's the place that is warming and moisturing um, the air. So that's a lot of blood over there. So um, in terms of causes for this uh, type of injury can be infections, um, dryness of the membranes, uh, those patients that are picking their nose, uh, or any, any form of trauma for what that matter. Uh, what we can do is to uh, apply pressure to the upper lip under the nose, compressing both nostrils, or by inserting a gauze or a cotton inside the bleeding nostril to put pressure. We do not tilt the patient head backward because that may increase the risk for them to aspirate blood and um, saliva into their respiratory tract. We always tilt the head forward. Um, in some cases, epistaxis can be um, the first sign of um, other conditions. Um, it can has um, a blood clotting abnormality or excessive high blood pressure and in sometimes even tumors. Infection. Um, and probably you know by now that the respiratory tract, and it's common um, knowledge and sense that the respiratory tract mucosa is the, one of the main portals for many, many disease producing organisms. Um, and um, the type of transfer of a disease from one person to the other um, that is more rapid in crowded places. Um, and based on this theory, we are 
currently maintaining social distancing um, is due to the fact that the droplets from one sneeze uh, may be loaded with billion of disease producing organisms and can resist um, in the air and sometimes on surfaces for a long time. If you remember when we discussed the mechanism that protect us from diseases, we said that mucous membranes may resist infections. They are one of the barriers and they have some mechanism of defending themselves. Um, one of them, as an example, will be the runny nose. And the runny nose um, associated with cold is the body's way to, as a result of inflammation of the mucosa, trying to remove um, the pathogens and protect deeper tissue uh, from um, um, an infection that is trying to uh, invade. Um, there are infections at the level of the, um, some of the infections can be localized at the level of the pharynx um, as a sore throat. Um, they may cause what is called laryngitis when that's an infection um, of the larynx or bronchitis infections at the level of the bronchi. Um, as, as an example of those kind of conditions, we have a wide range of both bacterial uh, and viral uh, conditions. Whenever they are located um, to the level of the nose and throat, they are called upper respiratory infections. Uh, the moment that they are moving downwards towards the lungs and they are affecting the, uh, the trachea, the larynx, the trachea, um, and the lungs, they become what is called an um, uh, inferior respiratory infection or lower inferior, uh, lower respiratory infection. Um, common cold is um, a widespread uh, condition. The, uh, the agent that is causing it, um, it's a virus. Um, however, there are um, hundreds of strains of the same uh, type of virus. That's why um, we do not vaccinate uh, against the common cold. Um, along, among others, we have what is called the rhinovirus. It is called rhino because rhino means nose. Um, the patients that have uh, the common cold will have a runny nose, will sneeze, will cough, um, will have a fever. The treatment is symptomatic um, and um, it's just supportive, treating the symptoms. The respiratory syncytial uh, virus, or the RSV, um, is the most common cause for lower respiratory tract infections in infants and, and uh, young children. The name of the virus comes from the fact that it will induce the fusion of cultured cells to become what is called a syncytium when they're grown in the laboratory. Um, they are causing what is called bronchiolitis uh, pneumonia. The virus may affect also the upper respiratory tract. However, it's very uh, common in premature infants, those that have other associated diseases as congenital heart disease, uh, and especially in those with immunodeficiency. Um, and um, very well recognized and preventable risk factor is exposure to cigarette smoke. Croup will um, affect children under three um, and is associated with a number of um, germs that can produce it. What is common for those conditions that are under the large group of group condition is the fact that there is an airway constriction that will produce a loud barking cough and associating with wheezing uh, and hoarseness. Whenever the group can be um, become severe, um, the child may have a squeaky noise that is called a stridor when it's breathing through a narrow trachea. Uh, again, a wide range of pathogens that can cause that from influenza to RSV, missiles. Um, what really helps um, is to, um, um, in terms of treatment, to have a humidifying room air uh, or having the child to breathe in the steam that will enlarge, will dilate the, um, the respiratory tract and will allow the child to breathe easier. In addition to that, we can uh, administer corticosteroids or bronchodilators. Influenza or the flu 
um, highly contagious condition, um, of mainly of the upper respiratory tract. We um, vaccinate each year uh, with um, effective, however, short um, short duration of the vaccination because those strains uh, are changing every year and the vaccination needs to be renewed. In terms of treatment, um, the symptoms of influenza are not different than those from the common cold. Uh, however, the course of the disease can be a little bit longer and the recovery is slower. Um, the treatment is just like in the case of the common cold uh, supported. Pneumonia is an infection at the level of the lungs. As a result of the infection, the alveoli, the air spaces will uh, become filled with fluid and um, in this fluid, the bacteria or the viruses um, are happy to multiply. In addition to that, the um, area that is full with fluid will not going to be able to participate in the uh, gas exchange. We have different types of pneumonia. We have what is called the lober pneumonia, that the infection will include the whole lobe of the lung at one time. Um, usually is um, caused by uh, pneumococcus, uh, which is a bacteria or legionella. Uh, and we have what is called the bronchopneumonia, um, where the disease is not in one lobe, but it's scattered everywhere. There are uh, tiny um, um, patches of, con of the condition everywhere throughout the lung, and usually is caused by staphylococcus or uh, proteus. Those conditions need, um, um, if they are caused by a bacteria, they will need antibiotic treatment. So because the pneumonia is, um, as a result of pneumonia, the uh, alveolus are full with fluid, that fluid uh, will, be, uh, will be called an exudate. There is a specific type of, a, a special type of pneumonia that is caused by a, a parasite, a protozoan that is called pneumocystis pneumonia uh, that lately was classified as a, as a fungus. Um, this is um, treated also with antimicrobial drugs and it's very uh, common in those immunocompromised patients, especially those that have uh, HIV. Tuberculosis, um, also an infection disease caused by a bacillus that is called Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, the bacillus may, invi may invade any type of tissue, but usually will grow and will start at the level of the lung. Uh, will start in the lungs and will form um, small regions that are called tubercle, um, where at the level of the lung usually is the primary uh, type of infection when it invades other tissues will be called uh, a secondary condition. Um, the treatment is usually um, long and can take between six months and 18 months, and uh, it should be done with um, a combination of antibiotics. Allergies, and uh, we'll discuss here a little bit more about allergic rhinitis, but there is a wide range of allergies. There are um, conditions that are characterized by hypersensitivity. Um, and usually the allergen, if you remember from the immune system, the allergen that produces a reaction from the body can be um, any type of plant-related allergens, as pollen, dust, mold, animal dander. Um, there is a seasonal type of um, allergic rhinitis that is called hay fever. And in the hay fever, the patient will come with watery discharge from both the eyes and the nose, sneezing and coughing. Um, sometimes headache may develop. Um, the treatment is to uh, prevent first and to eliminate the offending um, allergen from the individual's environment. Uh, in addition to that, we can administer antihistaminics, um, corticosteroid, and decongestion. Uh, asthma is um, another um, condition that um, is um, characterized by a hyper response uh, on the side of the patient. And may have many causes, uh, can be triggered by a lot of elements from exercise to um, pollen. 
And as a result of this trigger that will uh, sensitize the airways, the smooth muscles in the small airways in the bronchioles will uh, contract, will go through a spasm, and will obstruct the, um, the passageway. Uh, in addition to the contraction and the spasm of those um, uh, small um, bronchioles, there will be an inflammation and excessive mucus production at the level of the mucosa that will narrow even more the lumen and will increase the resistance to airflow. So what we see in this type of patients, we have what is called the labor breathing or dyspnea with withing. withing. What happens in this patient is that they can take air in, but the air cannot be released out. And there is that kind of shrieking um, uh, type of noise that they are making when they are trying to uh, breathe. And as a result of that, their chest will become like a barrel, becomes uh, hyperinflated because a lot of air will be trapped inside the lung. COPD or the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease um, describes uh, a, um, a series of uh, a cluster of conditions um, that inside those you will find the chronic bronchitis and emphysema. Uh, those patients will have in terms in common symptoms related to lung damage um, as a result of a destruction of these um, alveolus along with uh, chronic inflammation and excessive secretion at the level of the uh, bronchioles of the airway. The um, part of the process of respiration that is mainly affected in COPD is the exhalation um, that becomes progressively more elaborated as the disease um, is um, continuous. The crib death or the sudden infant death syndrome um, represents a condition where a, a child uh, will uh, perish, will die, a child that previously seemed perfectly healthy. And this happens under uh, one year of age. Um, usually the death occurs during sleep and there is no sign of what caused it. Um, there is no um, other source or the death uh, when the autopsy is made. Um, we know that there are some factors that will increase the risk for sudden infant death syndrome, and those will be exposure to cigarette smoke, um, an infant that is premature, a low for birth weight child. Um, and in order to prevent that, uh, we will just uh, try to educate our patients in terms of um, stop cigarette smoking around the child, uh, place the baby only on his or her back for sleeping, um, do not have any kind of uh, blankets or toys around the child while they are sleeping, um, have the child in a smoke-free environment as much as possible, and place them on firm, flat baby mattresses, nothing that is uh, foam or uh, soft. Uh, also, we'll need to avoid overheating the baby um, in the room is with as the um, overheat the room in terms of um, air that is warm or uh, overheating the baby by uh, clothing them too much. I will add here the um, surfactant deficiency disorder that is typical uh, for the um, premature babies, especially um, if they are born uh, before the 26 weeks of pregnancy, they, um, their lungs are not mature enough and they don't have the ability to produce a surfactant. Um, so by lacking the surfactant, they will have, they will develop what is called a respiratory distress syndrome of the newborn because their lungs will tend to, their alveolus will tend to collapse, stick uh, to each other and not ventilate the lungs. Usually this type of condition will, um, necessitate um, um, a ventilation, uh, artificial ventilation. Acute respiratory distress syndrome is um, a sudden and in some cases reversible inflammatory condition of the lung that is the result of an, a 
acute injury or infection is present usually in severely uh, diseased, um, in patients with severe diseases. During this condition, the airway will be will become progressively obstructed uh, with mucus. Um, the The condition is a result of sepsis, um, and the inflammation and the damage to the alveoli uh, will be followed by what is called pulmonary edema, um, dyspnea, and uh, hypoxemia. Um, those patients are usually uh, ventilated. Um, they need to be artificially ventilated. Respiratory characteristics, and um, especially the lung cancer, uh, is the leading cause uh, for death worldwide um, for both men and women. Um, the incidence uh, in women continues to increase. The increase world in a man has uh, stabilized. Um, in terms of risk factors for lung cancer, uh, we can put in this, the cigarette smoking, uh, including the modern cigarette that uh, the, uh, the vaping uh, cigarettes that they're way worse than the, the actual cigarettes. Um, the risk will increase in the cases of the, in the case of a patient that started to smoke early in life, uh, that are smoking large uh, quantities of cigarettes daily, and those that are uh, inhaling uh, deeply. Uh, is associated uh, usually with uh, certain degrees of COPD. Um, lung cancer can develop in secondhand smokers. Um, so, um, and also it's seen as an increased rate in those smoking cigars or pipe. The lung cancer comes in, um, um, the most common form will, will be called the bronchogenic uh, carcinoma uh, that the tumor is actually originating at the level of the bronchus and not in the, um, in the lung itself. Uh, the treatment is surgical, uh, can be followed by um, uh, radio or chemotherapy in some cases, uh, but surgery is the main um, um, treatment by removing the tumor. Some um, lung tumors can be secondary because they are metastasis of um, other cancers um, as stomach or breast. Another type of cancer at the level of the um, respiratory system is the cancer of the larynx. Um, will be usually a squamous cell carcinoma um, and it's related to cigarette smoking uh, and alcohol consumption. Again, the treatment will be surgical. And while trying to diagnose this, um, we'll see in the patient's signs and symptoms of sore throat and hoarseness, ear pain, and um, enlarged cervical lymph nodes. In uh, some cases, the patient will need um, a complete remover of the larynx of the voice box that will let them uh, unable to speak, um, and they will have to have a trach in place um, that will be permanent. Conditions that involve the pleural. Um, the pleurisy is an inflammation of the pleura, and usually it's associated with pneumonia or tuberculosis. Um, it's a result of an inflammation that is in the same area with the original um, injury of the um, of the lung. Uh, pneumothorax uh, represents an accumulation. Pneumo means air. Thorax means uh, thoracic cavity is an accumulation of air in the pleural space. Um, the lung in the affected side will collapse, will be partially or completely collapsed. And as a result of that, the patient will have uh, elaborate breathing. Uh, most of the times the pneumothorax is, a, uh, is an emergency. It can be in sometimes the result of a penetrating injury um, at the level of the chest wall. Um, or sometimes may be the result of a, a lung airspace of a bulla of the, of the uh, lung. Um, a variation of the pneumothorax is what is called a hemothorax. It can come with or without air. And the hemothorax is the accumulation of the blood in the pleural space. And it's usually a result of a penetrating chest wound.
there is a procedure that is called thor uh, thoracentesis um, that is used for diagnosis or uh, sometimes treating uh, respiratory system conditions. Uh, by um, in this uh, procedure, we are introducing a large bore, a large gauge needle uh, between the ribs inside the pleural space in order to remove fluid or to introduce medication. Uh, most of the time it's done uh, for uh, removing high quantities of uh, blood or fluid that would prevent the lung from um, performing or um, moving. Um, the liquid uh, will be sent to lab uh, and for cultures in order to uh, find out what caused the condition. The aging um, on the respiratory tract um, will, as I said before, will um, mainly affect the amount of elastic fibers at the level of the lungs. So the lungs and as a whole, the respiratory tract will lose the elasticity, becoming more rigid. In addition to that, the chest wall will become more rigid uh, as a result of um, arthritis in different uh, joints. And there will be a loss of strength in the breathing muscles. Um, as a result of that, there will be a decrease in compliance and the lung capacity. Uh, however, this will vary um, among different individuals and it will depend highly on their um, regular activities um, if they are used to walk or run or uh, swim. Also, there will be a reduced in our immune system ability, a reduced phagocytosis um, and other protective mechanism that will increase the susceptibility to um, infection. Uh, also, the incidence of lung disease will increase with age uh, and will be increased in those that are um, smoking cigarettes or they are exposed to um, any type of environmental irritants. There are some treatments that um, can be done at the level of the lungs. Um, and uh, this um, um, slide is um, giving you uh, a few of um, those equipments that are used in the treatment. By using a bronchoscope that can be rigid or flexible um, and is um, um, as has a fiber optic um, inside, uh, we can inspect both the primary and um, secondary uh, bronchi. Um, the bronchoscope can um, fix some of the issues, especially if that's, there is a um, foreign body that lodged in one of the uh, bronchi, it can remove it. Uh, if the bronchoscope can um, make the diagnosis by uh, observing, but you can um, identify um, a lesion and we can take biopsy. Um, oxygen therapy um, is um, obviously um, pro promoting um, and maintaining a um, good level of oxygen to the tissues. Um, in most cases, when we administer oxygen, um, that will be uh, moisture by uh, bub bubbling it through um, a layer of water, and that will bring it also to the, to the room temperature um, and can be heated. That can be the oxygen can be administered to our patients by mass, by catheters, or uh, <clears throat> nasal prongs. <clears throat> However, oxygen is highly flammable, so um, we need to um, advise our patients in terms of, in terms of uh, fire protection and um, smoking will be prohibited if we have patients that have uh, home use of oxygen. Um, in some conditions, we may use we use what is called the suction apparatus that will be used to um, remove any type of mucus or other substances that may accumulate in the respiratory tract of a patient by using what is called a negative pressure. We'll suck it out. Um, in some cases, we may attach to that a trap um, a container to trap secretions that can be sent to um, a lab. Some patient may request my need a tracheostomy tube that can be uh, temporary or permanent, um, and that's um, that type of procedure will be performed whenever the pharynx or the larynx have an obstruction. Um, that's a small metal or plastic tube 
that is inserted through a cut that is made at the level of the trachea through the throat. Um, and through the tracheostomy, the patients can be ventilated and sometimes they can use uh, the tracheostomy as um, by breathing uh, instead of using the upper respiratory system. We may have different machines that provide uh, uh, artificial respiration. Um, they are uh, ventilators um, where the patient will be intubated and mechanically uh, ventilated. By um, accessing the link above, you can see uh, a full bronchoscopy, how it's performed and what um, we can examine. The link above will uh, take you to a movie that presents you how tracheostomy is placed. What does the C in COPD stand for? Congestive, chronic, cumulative, or compliant? C in COPD stands for chronic. 